Buenos días a todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to La Casa On, this virtual space of La Casa Encendida. We are going to start the cycle on the metals for digital transition. And I would like to thank Transición Verde and the Green European Foundation for this necessary seminar that they have organized. And I would like to thank the speakers for sharing their time, their knowledge, and their expertise. I am really looking forward to listening to you, and I hope we have a very dynamic debate with the audience as well. And I just want to give the floor to Carol. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this event. Thank you so much, Elisa. Welcome, bienvenue, on behalf of the Green European Foundation and on behalf of the Foundation Transición Verdes and to the experts who are here today, but also to all of you who are connected to this interesting um, seminar. I wanted to just remind you some logistics details just to make sure that everything works well. Today's session is going to take place both in Spanish and English. So for those of you who want to listen to the translation you have on the right down corner, you will find an icon, which is an earth symbol. It's a symbol of the earth and you can choose the language and you can also write your questions on the chat. And we will have three extraordinary speakers. I am sure you will have lots of questions to ask to them after their introductions. You can simply write your questions on the chat and who the question is for, and we will be asking those questions during the second part of this session. So thank you very much. Before we begin, I wanted to highlight the importance of opening up this topic and having a debate such as the one that we're organizing here today. In the EU, we all agree that energy transition is very much needed, but it's also needed to put on the table the weak uh, spots or the weaknesses that this has, and we need to find a solution amongst all of us. And that's what we try to do with this debate, but also with the second part, which will take place on April 7th, which I invite you to follow as well. So we're going to talk about the part that we don't like about the energy transition that has to do with renewable energies and any device that we might be using, such as cell phones that we use on, on the daily. And we also want to talk about how we can solve the environmental challenges that metals and rare earths really entail. And we have here Richard Voters. I hope I said his name right. He's a researcher in the Vatten Schablik Bureau. Uh, and he, that's the think tank that the Dutch Green have. And he is the one directing the project of the Green European Foundation, which is Metals for a Digital Europe, which is a very necessary, very necessary uh, topic because this obviously will increase the demand of metals for 2050. So Richard, tell us a bit more about this project. Yes, thank you, Carol. I'll try to share my screen. There it is. Um, so um, this project for the Green European Foundation is about uh, metals. Metals are the Achilles heel of the energy and digital transitions. Um, according to the European Commission, uh, we will need uh, in 2050 60 times more lithium, 50 times more cobalt and 10 times more rare earth metals than today for the energy transition alone. And uh, one of the problems is that already the EU is between 75 and 100 percent dependent on imports for most of the metals it uses. Um, this raises a number of uh, issues. Um, of course, the rapid depletion of certain metal ores. Uh, do current generations have the right to rapidly deplete stock of metal ores in the ground at the expense of future generations? Um, the EU's dependence on imports, um, especially from China, is clearly the issue. Uh, China, for example, supplies 98% of rare earth to the EU. Um, so the question is, with the energy transition, do we uh, exchange one unwanted dependency on, on Russia for natural gas for an even more risky dependency on China for uh, metals? 
Um, then there are the problems with uh, mining, uh, especially in uh, developing countries, huge ecological uh, damage. Mining is a dirty business uh, and also uh, human rights violations. Um, the mining of cobalt and coltan in the Democratic Republic of Congo is a case at hand. Uh, so the question is, do people in developing countries where mining takes place pay the price for our European green and digital ambitions? Um, then there is a clash between Europe's demand for raw materials, for instance, for new battery factories, and uh, the ambition of uh, many developing countries to move up the value chain. Um, for instance, uh, Indonesia has uh, restricted the export of metal ores, such as nickel, uh, because they want to process these ores uh, within their own borders. Uh, semi-finished products uh, are more profitable than raw ores. So this way, Indonesia wants to earn more money with less uh, mining and less uh, damage. However, the European Commission uh, lodged a complaint with the w WTO uh, against Indonesia's export restrictions. Uh, question is, is that uh, justified from a development perspective? Um, then, of course, there are the controversies around uh, new mining projects in uh, Europe. They always provoke uh, civil protests. And um, the circular economy will be an important part of our uh, project. Um, some politicians uh, suggest that uh, uh, the promise of a circular economy uh, solves all questions about mining. Um, let me be clear, uh, recycling of metals is very important and we should become better at it. Uh, but it is not a miracle solution. Um, take the critical metals I just mentioned, lithium, cobalt and rare earth. Uh, we just don't have enough of these metals in our current stock uh, to meet our future needs. Uh, if all the lithium that has been extracted and refined over the last 10 years would be available for recycling, uh, it would not even be enough for one year of electric vehicle production. Uh, so we will need metals from mining in the coming decades, um, at least until we have an economy which is completely fossil free and completely circular. Um, how much mining? How much mining do we need? Uh, perhaps less than the European Commission uh, predicts, if we apply broader circular principles. Uh, the circular economy is not just about uh, recycling. Um, in this uh, figure, you see that this recycling is just uh, one of many circular strategies, and the most effective strategies actually are uh, refuse, rethink, and reduce. Um, so this involves questioning our current lifestyles and consumption patterns. Um, for instance, should we replace every fossil fuel car with an electric car, or is it better to share vehicles? Um, is our growing data consumption inevitable? Uh, do we need an even more versatile smartphone every two years? And for the Greens, uh, the strategies that are at the top of the circularity ladder Refuse, rethink, reduce are not taboo uh, subjects. So these strategies will certainly be part of our metals project. Um, we will organize about 10 uh, webinars uh, in the framework of this project. We will uh, put online a multimedia dossier and a discussion platform. We aim for a final publication, which is a, an agenda for polit political action at all levels. Uh, to tackle the metal issues. Um, the project is truly European, uh, with partners from uh, Spain to Poland to Finland. And your ideas are welcome. You see my email address uh, here. If you have any suggestions, please send them to me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard. Very interesting. Uh, 
es muy, muy buena pinta tiene esa plataforma eh, para poder debatir ¿no? y, y discutir este, este tema y sobre todo ver qué posibles soluciones vamos a tener, eh, a tener que afrontar ¿no? para, para el futuro si queremos efectivamente una sociedad y una transición descarbonizada. Eh, voy a dar la bienvenida a Guillaume Priton. Eh, bienvenido y eh, merci beaucoup de, de contar. De, de... So, thank you, thank you for coming. Él es periodista de investigación y realizador de documentales. Okay. He is a journalist and he does documentaries. In 2018, he published the book The War of Rare Metals, The uh, Dark Side of uh, Transition. And I really um, encourage you to read it because it's very interesting. He has gotten very important awards for his job as a journalist, as a research journalist. And I'm sure that this is a job that is not easy at all, is it, Guillaume? Well, no, it's, it's not very easy, but because it can be dangerous to go to mining areas in China to see how uh, people extract rare metals uh, in uh, Heilongjiang or in the province of Baotou uh, in Inner Mongolia. Uh, so that's kind of a dangerous job, physically speaking, but that's okay, I can manage. But also uh, financing a research for years on a topic uh, such as this one is also difficult. Uh, you know, you, you need to find funds as a journalist to travel on the field and to, to get uh, the, the, the information. So maybe that's also a, probably one of the most difficult points to, to, to address. Just one point, the book you're mentioning is published in, uh, has been published in 2019 in Spain. The name is La Guerra de los Metales Raros, and I think it's a Peninsula publisher. Perfect, in Peninsula, okay. And it's also uh, published by Scribe, uh, The Rare Metals War in English. Sorry, I, I shut up now. <laughs> Perfect. Pues, eh, eh, luego lo, lo compartimos Great. En we will share it on the chat so that everyone can can see it and and can get it and you can now start with your presentation if you want Guillaume. sure um well uh, as as you mentioned i'm a journalist i've been uh, traveling for six years uh, until 2018 uh, to write that book that has been mentioned And I have a very strong interest in these uh, rare, critical raw materials that have been uh, introduced by Mr. Richard Voters. Uh, indeed, as, as it's been said, right, uh, we're going to have to dig a lot of resources in the future to be able to, to succeed uh, with the Green Deal and with the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to look at this issue through the bias of these resources, because obviously, We're not going to get rid of oil anytime soon. We're going to have to, you know, to, we're going to have to, to deal for a long time still with oil, uh, but we're going to move progressively towards a better electric, electricity mix in the future. And because we're going to have to, to, to because we're going to have, have more and more green resources in our electricity mix, we're going to have to dig more and more of these metals. And the question is, where are we going to get them? And what, what are going to be the ecological, economic, and also a geopolitical cost of extracting them. And if we look at this uh, energy transition and the green deals with the bias of the resources, well, I think we have a different picture. And let me be clear. First, I'm not funded by oil. And second, we need to do this energy transition. I just want to be clear with my intentions. Uh, it's out of question to remain stick with oil and coal. We need to do this energy transition. But we also need to be aware of the new challenges that it, that it brings. And probably these challenges are as important uh, as the challenges of the past century. Um, we need to extract rare metals. So what are we talking about? We're talking about rare metals. This is a common name which is being used by uh, economists because these metals are more rare than uh, uh, abundant and base metals. So in the Earth's crust, you've got like iron, copper, aluminium, lead, but you also have metals which are naturally associated with these base metals in the Earth's crust, but in proportions which can be up to 3,000 times less than a base metal. So uh, this is why we call them rare metals, even if we can find them everywhere on Earth. And these rare metals, we can mention cobalt, tungsten, um, uh, rare earths, which is a specific class of rare metals. We can also talk 
about gallium, indium, antimony, and so on. There are about 30 or 40 rare metals, which are also called, for most of them, critical metals by the EU Commission. And there is a new list of e, uh, critical minerals, uh, metals, raw materials and metals, which has been published uh, at the end of 2020. And you will find in this list most of the rare metals that I've mentioned. We cannot do an energy transition without them. It's just not possible. We need them for most of the electric cars. We need them for uh, offshore wind turbines. We need these rare metals for, and, and critical metals such as silicium, for example, for solar panels. Uh, and also uh, we talk about energy storage for wind farms and solar farms because uh, we want to store the electricity when it's night, when there is no wind. So we're gonna have to even dig more in order to, to manufacture the batteries to, to store the electricity. So there is no way today that we can do without them. It's hard to substitute them and it's hard to recycle them. And um, we need to extract these resources usually in poor countries. Uh, it usually, really usually happens in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or it happens in Bolivia or in, uh, in China, China, which is one of the biggest producers today of these uh, rare and strategic metals. And my job as a journalist has been to actually travel on the field and to, to, to report on the extracting conditions and refining conditions of these metals uh, at the other end of the world. And uh, let me tell you, uh, clean energy is a dirty affair. It's dirty to make something clean. And, and we don't realize that because when we use the clean technology, it's clean when we use it. But we don't see the producing process and we don't see the, the, the recycling process, which are per se uh, dirty processes, especially when it happens in China, where environmental regulations, which do exist, by the way, are not necessarily enforced. So there is a real issue with uh, a real ecological issue around this uh, extraction of real resources. Uh, I talked to uh, many people living around the areas, uh, the mining and refining areas, which they talk about cancers and other problems. I talked also with specialists in the rare metals industries in China. And I remember one a specialist, a Chinese industry, a Chinese industry specialist, a lady, uh, Vivian Vu, who said to me once, uh, China has devastated its environment to feed the rest of the world with rare earths. And rare earths are necessary for the vast majority of, uh, of uh, electric cars. Um, and we don't realize that because actually the pollution is far away. We could have the mining processes in Europe, but we, we just don't want to have the mining uh, industry in Europe because it's dirty. So there's been a process in the 80s, 90s of relocating these industries to other countries which were ready to bear the environmental cost of these resources uh, so that we could, we as, uh, as clients of these countries, just get the resource uh, cleaned and we could put them in our green technologies. So we have relocated the industries and we have somehow relocated the pollution of these uh, this green technologies because we don't have to bear the environmental cost of the rare metals. So there is here a huge environmental impact, which is going probably to gain importance regarding the figures that has been shown by Richard Wouters. We're gonna to have to, to dig more and more for being able to bear the incredible is the dynamics of turning towards green energy. And as Richard Wouters says, uh, recycling is a tricky process. It's difficult to recycle these metals. It's not gonna be a miracle solution. We're gonna to have to be able to, to recycle some of them to a certain percentage, uh, but not all of them. And we're gonna to have to go back to the mine anyhow, anyway, in order to, to sustain the, the, the expansion of our green uh, technology world. The cost is obviously human, it's uh, sanitary, it is ecological, but the cost is also certainly uh, economical because, and this is where we move to geopolitics. I was asked to speak about geopolitics. Uh, we're gonna have to get these resources from China. And we have had something last year, it was name is and still today, which is COVID-19. And suddenly we discovered that we didn't have any mask or we were lacking some medication and we had to actually get them from China. And we realized that we were dependent on specific strategic resources. And it's true with strategic minerals, which are critical and rare, we have to get them from China. And it's been years, 10 years, since we have had to get these resources from China, actually more than 10 years, probably 30, 20, 30 years. Since the beginning of the 20th century, 21st century, China is less and less exporting these resources and keeping, keeping these resources for itself because it needs actually uh, these rare 
critical strategic metals for its own green technological needs. And uh, China says you won't have these resources anymore, but actually you can move your, you can relocate your uh, uh, down the value chain uh, industries to China and you'll get access to the resources. So there is kind of a deal which is being offered by China. It's been the case for 20 years. Uh, we'll give you the resource, but you will give us the technologies that use the resources. And it's gonna be like a deal where uh, you're gonna have access to the resource, but we're gonna learn a lot from you. And this is where one of the reasons why we have actually passed on a certain number of uh, uh, um, uh, technologies and know-how and research and development processes to China in exchange for the resource. And this has certainly accelerated a movement where China were, was able to produce green technologies made of Western knowledge until producing green technologies made of Chinese knowledge, because it's not only made in China anymore, it's made by China. And uh, today we are seeing that China is very strong on this uh, uh, industrial processes, on the cutting edge of this green technology processes, because it has been able to move down the value chain. And China is not only able to mine the resource, but also to produce the very high technologies with high value added in very high tech laboratories. So the, it, it brings a question of our dependency towards China. And we cannot be dependent upon Chinese supplies for such strategic uh, industries. And the question will be, how do we gain uh, uh, mineral sovereignty back in Europe for the next decades? And that's a question which, which can be addressed later during the discussion. Uh, let me bring back a point, uh, maybe a last point for the few minutes that I have left. Upon um, the, uh, the arrival of Joe Biden at the US presidency, Joe Biden is very much aware of the dependency of the United States uh, towards China, especially for rare earths, because rare earths are necessary for uh, defense technologies. Trump already was very much aware of this dependency, and tr uh, Biden is not going to do any different comparing to Trump. He's, he's today, it's, it's happening right now, it's news, uh, trying to consider how much the United States are dependent upon Chinese supplies and considering developing a, a, a US mineral sovereignty, both for US national security needs defense needs, but also for green technologies. Uh, the question is, which is being brought by this news is what is going to be the geopolitics of this uh, Green Deal? Um, is there is a new geopolitics of, of, of Green Deal, a new geopolitics of renewable energies arising because we're going to have to get these resources somewhere. So we see that there are tensions between China and the United States for securing their excesses, but also it's going to be the question uh, for European countries. We're going to have to need so much of lithium and rare earths and cobalt, as it's been said, where are we going to get these resources? With which uh, countries, mining countries, are we going to secure the supplies? The European Commission has been very strong for the last 10 years or so in developing a mineral diplomacy with uh, Latin American countries. The name of this uh, diplomacy is called EULA, uh, Raw Material Dialogue. Uh, I was myself part of this dialogue for at, at some point. Uh, the, the question is, how are we going to secure the resources with these countries, but also with African countries, maybe with other Asian countries in order to circumvent the, the, the our dependency towards China? And we know that there are lots of these resources into the oceans. So are there gonna be some new uh, diplomacy, uh, oceanic diplomacy in order to secure uh, the most strategic reserves of specific rare earth uh, granulates on, on the depths of the Pacific or the Atlantic? I think that's a question worth uh, being, being addressed. Obviously, uh, this green world will probably uh, you know, unveil a new world where the Middle East will lose its importance, part of its importance, but where other uh, countries, uh, very, very rich of these resources and ready to take the lead in the mining and processing of these resources, will be the new Arabi Saudia of rare and strategic metals. Let's talk about China. 
Let's talk about South Africa, which, which has a lot of platinum. Let's talk about Indonesia, which is a country absolutely rich of nickel, notably, and other resources. Uh, let's talk about uh, Bolivia and Australia with lithium. Let's talk about copper in Chile. Copper is not a rare metal, but copper is one of the most needed metal for green technologies, notably for electric cars. You need up to four times more copper for an electric car than for, for an oil car. So we will see probably new countries uh, uh, rich with their uh, with their with their uh, mining uh, potential, uh, taking the lead and trying to 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 gain to do like China to go down the value chain in order to not only send the minerals but sell the technologies which use the mineral exactly like China did. So if I want to sum up. That, a fast, that is a fascinating world that is awaiting us, this green world, very exciting one. And I think that's gonna be a very, very complicated world too with the new geopolitics. It's not gonna be better or worse, it's just gonna be different. Uh, the question on the pure ge geopolitical viewpoint for Europe is how do we uh, just, uh, uh, how do we succeed in uh, building a, a policy which makes us independent, sovereign on our needs and on the technologies. And although it brings on the environmental part, a huge question, which is uh, how are we going to make sure that we uh, add to a low carbon world, a low resource world? Because a low carbon world would not necessarily be a low resource world. This is what we need to understand. And this is where the circular economy and recycling more specifically, but also lots of other uh, issues dealing with, uh, with the way we consume, as Richard Voter says, is it great to, to drive with a Tesla or is it better to share a Tesla or to share any kind of car? I think it brings the question of our consumption trends, which is the hardest questions to be asked. But this is gonna be one of the main questions which, going to have to, which, which we were gonna to have to address in the main, in the future years in order to achieve this energy transition. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Guillaume. Thank you so much, Guillaume. As you said, it's a fascinating debate. And what you're saying about the consumption model is going to be key. It's true that this green transition is going to have as its main protagonist geopolitics and green transition is not possible without rare metals but we cannot externalize the negative effects towards third parties obviously and we are going to be talking about that with our next guest uh, with Henrike Hahn she is a um, German MP at the European Parliament and she's a member of the group for industry and energy and she's also a uh, part of the um, negotiations with the US and China. What is going to be the role of the EU in this, um, in, in this tipping point? Henri Henrike? Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful invitation to talk about this uh, incredibly in interesting topic. And uh, Carol, Guillaume and Richard, you were mentioning so many details I work on as well. It's really fascinating to listen to your arguments here as well. And I'm happy to, um, to present your mind as well. So uh, global competition for access to critical raw materials is growing significantly. And one of the reasons for that is also our digital lifestyle. Carol was mentioning before, the rapid development of digital applications, increased use of smartphones and all sorts of digital equipment. We're all used to this kind of equipment on a daily basis. Indeed, we just use it in this very moment to talk to each other via Zoom, right? And uh, for example, a smartphone can contain up to 50 different kinds of metals, all of which contribute to its small size, lightweight, and functionality. And in general, technological progress relies on access to a growing number of raw materials the way we currently produce or consume. But raw materials are also very positively closely linked to clean technologies. They're ir ir irreplaceable in solar panels, in wind turbines, in electric vehicles, and energy efficient lighting. And um, although the domestic production of certain critical raw materials exists in the EU, notably hafnium, for example, in most cases, the EU is currently dependent on imports from non-EU countries. And in this context, the EU's foreign policy on critical raw materials currently focuses 
mostly on ensuring well diversified and undistorted secure access to global markets. So this is an approach we Greens see in a much more diversified way, of course, but it's just, uh, we just have to spell it out that way. And trade policy for critical raw materials has accordingly the clear goal to avoid export taxes, import duties, or price fixing by foreign suppliers. And this goal is pursued in bilateral or multilateral dialogues and agreements such as free trade agreements, like for example, with Vietnam, and if needed supported, supported by the WTO dispute settlement system. And Europe imports lithium for electric cars, platinum to produce clean hydrogen, silicon metal for solar panels to give some example. And 98% of rare earth elements Europe currently needs comes from a single supplier, we talked about it today already, from China. So the import of rare earths from China certainly is a critical issue for Europe because Europe has no mining or processing activity for these important minerals. Nevertheless, our production refers to it. And if not managed otherwise, in the following years, the so-called dependence on China will further increase as the demand for green technology increases. For example, the Joint Research Center estimated that it EU's annual critical raw material demand for wind turbines will increase between two and 15 times over the next three decades. So overall, we can say the European Commission expects Europe's demands for critical raw materials to double by 2050. This is a huge number, right? It's amazing. And as for other countries, we rely, we rely strongly upon up on Turkey provides 98% of the EU supply of borat, and South Africa provides 71% of the EU's needs for platinum, and we still have other examples like that. And this over-reliance is not sustainable, we really have to say that. Um, so of course we have to ask the question, what can we do about it? So first of all, we must limit our overconsumption. And we must invest in circular technologies that, the, the, that reuses resources instead of constantly extracting them. So current geopolitical commission made a dual twin and digital transition of economy and society one of its main objectives from the start and focused on this being also a key element of recovery from the corona pandemic. And the critical raw materials are key to enable this. And the commission launched in, two, in uh, uh, two, uh, last year, perhaps its most significant policy push since the very first raw materials initiative of 2008. As announced in the March uh, 2020 industrial strategy, it launched a critical raw materials action plan in, in which it proposed to make the EU's raw materials supply more secure and sustainable. And then the EU has also proposed to create a European Raw Materials Alliance, the so-called ERMA, that aims to make Europe economically more resilient and this wants to be achieved by diversifying its supply chains, creating jobs, attracting investments to the raw materials value chain, and also to foster innovation, to train young talents, and to contribute to the best framework for raw materials and the circular economy worldwide can contribute to the goal as well, of course. And then as a third point, we have the European Battery Alliance, which is also important to mention. It was launched in 2017 by the European Commission, uh, EU countries, industry, and the scientific community, because the Commission aims to make Europe a global leader in sustainable battery production and use. And that's, of course, an important point as well. Europe will need more and more batteries to reach the goal of climate neutrality. And the European market for batteries will be worth 250 billion euro already in 2025. That's a lot of money. And Europe still relies massively on batteries that are entirely or partially made abroad often with environmental standards that lack our European ambition, as we all know. And supported by the Commission and the European Investment Bank, the European Battery Alliance brings together EU national authorities, regions, industry, research institutes, and other stakeholders in the battery value chain. And let's get back to the foreign policy question. On the foreign policy front, there are several initiatives promoting the greening of the critical raw material policy. To start with, the Commission announced that in ongoing free trade agreement negotiations, 
with a number of countries that are important from a raw materials perspective, there will be potential for leveling the playing field further to allow European industries to compete on an equal footing with third country companies to engage directly in sustainable and responsibility sourced raw materials. And then we have an additional instrument in this context, EU's engagement in critical raw materials focused strategic partnerships with resources rich third countries, for example, in Africa, Ukraine or Western Balkans. And the EU Commission will discuss priorities with member states and industry and plans on the basis of the outcome to launch pilot partnership projects still in 2021. So that's an interesting approach as well. So a resolution with recommendations to the Commission on corporate due diligence and corporate accountability was adopted just last week on Wednesday, uh, last week in plenary, that's also important to mention. And the text calls on the EU to oblige companies to identify and to address human rights, health, environmental and good governance risks arising from their activities throughout their supply chain. And we in the parliament, we call for the introduction of a civil liability mechanism and legal remedies for victims. And on trade, we want to go further and call for a ban on the import of products like linked to serious human rights violations such, such as forced or child labor. And with this text, uh, we in the parliament believe that it's delivering a, a turnkey directive to the commission. And we hope that the legislative proposals to be presented in June this year will live up to its ambitions. And the laws, if enacted in the proposed very broadly reaching form would also cover the critical raw materials value chains. So that, that's what we talk about here, right? So that can be very relevant as well. So now let me tell you some words on the trade policy review. Um, following broad consultations, the Commission proposed a trade policy review in February 2021, and it strongly supports the green dimension of trade policy. And while not specifically launching new actions in the critical raw materials area, the communication mentions them twice in the context of openness, as EU strategic choice, and as a part of the network of bilateral trade agreements. And when we zoom in on some interesting details, the strategy also says that in shaping global rules, including at the WTO, the Commission will endeavor use all the tools at its disposal to support environmental sustainability, which should become one of the WTO's purpose defining goals. And the review also commits to undertaking greater effort to ensure the effective implementation and enforcement of sustainable development chapters in new trade agreements to level up environmental standards globally. So I think that's a very interesting uh, point as well. And with regard on the engagement of the EU and international fora, you all know it probably, the Commission also cooperates with a range of partners on critical raw materials and their sustainability and environmental dimensions. For example, the annual EU-US-Japan trilateral or trilateral on critical raw materials, the EUOCD, the United Nations, the WTO and the G20, of course. And then let me come back to your question, what our green group uh, proposals are, because I'm actually, I'm uh, the green group rapporteur on the report on the European strategy for critical raw materials in the committee on industry. So I will spend a lot of time and the upcoming months working on that. And for us in the green group, it's very clear that while planning our green industry strategy, we must be very vig vigilant to the limited availability of raw materials on our planet. For us, it's, it's clear we wanna protect our planet. We must be aware of the tremendous ecological consequences of the exploitation we were committing over the last decades. And we don't wanna continue like that, right? And for years, industry was confronted with a glowing dilemma. On the one hand, it's dependent on resource imports. And on the other hand, the importing companies have a special responsibility for a sustainable supply of raw materials with regard to ecological, social, and human rights aspects. And for us, the extraction, processing, and use of natural resources is, of course, like we were discussing before, about justice and development opportunities for research-rich countries. 
We have to fight against human rights abuses. We have to protect the most vulnerable in the production process or related to that production process. And currently many minerals and raw materials come to Europe that are mined under conditions that are as unsustainable in human rights terms that serve to finance um, conflicts or that contribute significantly to environmental destruction. So therefore, a comprehensive supply chain law with binding human rights due diligence obligations for all companies must make commodity trade sustainable. And in addition to human rights compliance, sustainable development of natural livelihoods and environmental protection must become legally binding. And this applies to both to raw materials and to processed products. Do I have to really to say that? That's an important aspect too. Uh, rules on mandatory due diligence linked to protecting the environment and social standards must become mandatory. This is a question of global justice for us Greens. And we have to ensure that raw materials haven't been extracted under forced labor or in connection with human rights violations or armed conflicts. We have also to reduce the raw materials consumption and processing. That's also a very complicated point. We don't have much time you know, at this moment, but we also have to increase the raw materials efficiency to recycling and substitution is a key word. The future lies in the circular economy. We all know that Richard was spelling that out before with long life designed and repairable products ensured by high quality recycling largely closed material cycles and priority use of recycled raw materials. And we just had a, um, a good point in the parliament recently, just last month, the European parliament adopted its proposal on the EU circular, circular economy action plan, urging the European commission to set binding 2030 targets for materials use and consumption footprint of all products placed on the EU market. And I think that's a pretty good success. So, uh, let's hope that we go, will continue uh, to work in that, uh, in that direction. So we also have back measures to establish a strong market for secondary materials to compete with current cheap virgin materials, as well as clear product information on consumer rights, like on warranties, for example. These are very clear demands by the parliament uh, we have, and of course, in general, we can say uh, we can only meet the climate targets by shifting to a circular economy, by uh, the transition that needs to happen by 2050 at the latest. And the raw material strategy we have here will be a play will play an important role. Global consumption of materials is expected to double in the next 40 years, with the amount of waste generated every year projected to increase 70 percent by 2050. And increasing resource efficiency is also another key element of um, our raw materials possible po uh, policy and strategy. So I think I don't have a, uh, I didn't have a look uh, at my watch, but I think for these to be effective, there needs to be a comprehensive monitoring of compliance with the standards as well as the sanction mechanism. And in general, let me conclude by saying that the Green Deal is at root an effort to transform the European economy and European consumption patterns. And it, it, it entails a fundamental overall of the European energy system. It has an enormous foreign policy dimension. It will and it already redefines Europe's global policy priorities. And I believe in a proactive EU attitude that will help to turn potential friction into opportunities for renewed international partnerships. So the EU should become a global standard setter, not only for the energy transition, but also for the responsible use of raw materials. We need a green raw material strategy for that, right? And I'm really looking forward to the discussion now. Thanks for your patience with all these long explanations. I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Muchas gracias, Enrique. It was very interesting to listen to you, and I'm sure that within the, the Green Group, you tackle this debate very often. And I will say that it has to be sure, efficient, sustainable, and I think, and I coincide, that the EU needs to have a fundamental role 
by increasing the environmental standards and also the enforcement of everything that has to do with the respect of human rights, because it's fundamental. And I would like to thank you all for your presentations. Thank you so much for respecting the time that was given to you. That will allow us to have uh, 45 minutes for a very interesting debate until half past one. Um, Richard, who's the director of this project, I'm sure has something to say. I'm sure that he has lots of questions to ask or to answer, maybe. Yes, uh, thank you, Guillaume and uh, Henrique, for your excellent uh, introductions. And I have a lot of questions and I will try to, to limit myself. Um, First, uh, first question is to uh, Guillaume. Um, in your introduction, you made it clear that uh, the geopolitical tables are uh, turning. Um, in your book, which is uh, excellent, by the way, you even write that uh, metals importing states will be at the mercy of supplying countries. Uh, which means that the, the, the governments of mining countries will, will have a lot of uh, bargaining power um, on the world stage. Uh, my question is, does this uh, bargaining power extend to the people on the ground as well? Um, can, will local communities affected by mining projects uh, in the future uh, be able to hold the mining companies to higher standards? Um. Until now, Richard, uh, and this is based on my observations on the field, I haven't seen any bargaining power being gained by local communities around extracting areas or refining areas. At least where I've been, I haven't been everywhere on the world, right? I've been mostly to China. And wherever I've been in China, uh, it's either illegal mining process or it is uh, uh, it's the, 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 I've spoken with many people and you know their salary is very basic. Their monthly wage is maybe you know a couple of hundreds of, of euros, but not that much. It's, it's basically the basic salary of, of the Chinese worker. Uh, you have theoretically regulations in order to frame the extraction and the refining processes but uh, they are not respected in practice. That's what I've heard a lot. So you've had industries doing whatever they want. There probably is uh, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, supervising uh, visits made from Beijing by someone from the, you know, central power. But once this person has, uh, is back in the plane, back to Beijing, everything just, you know, happens as it used to, uh, you know, without any change. And that's what I heard a lot. And there's a phrase, in, in China, which which was said once by a villager close to a mine, he said, you know, the, the emperor is far and the mountains are high. That seems to be a Chinese proverb, which says what, what it says. Uh, we are far away and the power doesn't reach out to where we are. So I haven't seen any, 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 uh, any, anything like what you've said, uh, any empowerment of local communities uh, until now. That being said, that's just what I want to add. Uh, ecology is being becoming very important in China. That's becoming one of the most serious cause of uh, social unrest in China, the first one actually. Uh, demonstrations are forbidden, but you find a lot of demonstrations regarding uh, environment. Not necessarily around the mine, but more generally because of the air, which is not clean in the city, or because uh, there is a coal, uh, you know, electricity power plant, which is polluting too much of the air. You, you have to understand that when I was in March, uh, I think it was in March 2017, was a bit of time ago, but I remember I was in a city, and, uh, and the city, uh, they had seen the sun for the first time in March for six months, because the sky during the winter was completely, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, was was full of, of of cloud due to the coal 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 mining, is a coal uh, power plant, and for the first time they would see the sun after six months, and they would take a picture of the sun with their with their smartphone, because they hadn't seen the sun for for six months. So it tells you an idea about not the fact that it's very polluted the air over there. So, and this this is a point that I want to say is that 
the Communist Party has to change very quickly. They have to move uh, forward uh, towards uh, respecting, uh, putting stronger relations, enforcing them, uh, because this is a legitimacy of the PCC itself, uh, of the Communist Party itself, which is at stake here. So I can see in the long term, not in the short term right now, but in the medium long term, uh, uh, an empowerment from not necessarily local communities around the mining areas, but more generally from the Chinese people themselves, uh, from the not in my backyard generation of uh, middle class who don't want only to have a quantity of life, but a quality of life. And that's gonna change China, China in, the, in the future for sure. Uh, and, and the better working conditions, mining conditions, refining conditions uh, in the future will not necessarily come from European uh, you know, uh, regulations imposed on, on China, but from China itself for this reason. Yeah, does that mean uh, you don't think the uh, European due diligence obligations that Henrico was talking about uh, will have an impact um, in China? And if not, may, may they have an impact in countries like uh, the Democratic Republic yeah. of Congo? I'll be shorter for the second answer. Uh, yes, it will. But you have to re remember that uh, this uh, the, the new regulation which was passed, uh, which was put into application in January 2021 uh, for the sourcing of uh, ethical thirteen supply of, of minerals applies to four minerals. It applies to gold, tin, tantalum, and uh, I think it's uh, forget coltan or I forgot the last the four one, but only four. Uh, all the other metals uh, are not, uh, you know, uh, taken into consideration by this new relation uh, from uh, 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 from this new e, uh, by this new e regulation. And the other ones are mostly Chinese made minerals. So uh, there is there will be a need for enlarging actually the, the, the scope of application of these new regulations to other minerals. It's under process. The OECD is pushing towards that direction. Uh, and it will, but as for now, uh, we, we must show that there is, uh, analyze that there is dynamic, uh, which is a, a, a very positive dynamic, uh, but there is still, uh, you know, steps to be, uh, to be uh, taken in order to enlarge that dynamic to a larger scope of materials in order to not only talk about uh, DRC uh, extracted minerals, such as what it is right now, but world wild extracted minerals. That's my answer. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Um, I think Henrik Johan wants to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much because it's such an interesting topic. Um, and I could tell you from the green perspective that we have um, the view that the local communities should uh, in enjoy a legally enshrined right to free prior and informed consent, including the right to say no. Uh, to mining in order to address the current imbalance of power between mining companies, member states, and communities. And if we say that from the green perspective, um, this represents a dramatic and necessary departure from the EU's current proceed and funding of programs financing the mining and manufacturing industries while seeking to secure social license to operate and social acceptance of mining. And these are based on a biased misrepresentation of legitimate opposition in the face of a widespread lack of transparency, compliance and corruption, which leads to surveillance and cohesion of local communities rather than recognizing their agency rights and serious concerns. And I can tell you, for example, from my uh, pers working perspective, like um, we fight also on the legislative files, for example, you know, we are on tiny, tiny words on that um, to, to get this approach. And this is really important. And I think in general, well, we can say that metals and minerals should be treated as common um, public goods rather than treating, regulating and creating policy about minerals and metals as if they were simply sources of capital, right? It's, it's something that uh, belongs to all of us and we really have to, to show some resp responsibility when we use them. So, so that's just to, uh, as a little addition from the green perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Henrike. Um, one last question from me to, to both of you. Um, based on uh, a comment by, by Hervé Bergicol uh, in the comments section, uh, he wrote, uh, making mining clean is the true challenge. And my question would be, is that even possible to make mining clean? 
Uh, I can try to answer that question first. Uh, uh, I think there are two uh, extremes here. Uh, we have an extreme, at least in France, we refer to uh, Emile Zola novels back to the 19th century in the coal mining. Uh, the name of the of the, no, the novel is Germinal. And when you say in French, this is Germinal, you say basically, if we open a mine today in Europe, that's gonna be Germinal, that's gonna be hell. And that is extremely an extreme view because we cannot do that anymore in Europe. It's not possible to, to reproduce this germinal <laughs> era two centuries back. The other extreme is to say, we're gonna do clean green mineral. And that is not possible. Uh, when I heard that there is a new a company whose name is Deep Green, which offers to mine minerals very deep into the oceans, you can say whatever you want. Maybe it's less polluting than if you extract from the ground and you can show me figures, but it's never going to be green. And obviously, there is a scars which remains in the ground when you extract something. Uh, not only extract it, but actually refine it. The most polluting process of everything is actually the refining process. Extracting is impressive, especially when it's an open pit, but mostly the refining process is very difficult because you can have thousands and thousands of tons of ore and you end up with under only one kilo of pure purified, 100% purified rare metal. So this is gonna be the, 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 the most productive part. You can do better, you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can clean the process, you can refine the water once it's being used for cleaning the, uh, refining the ore, but obviously you will never do something which, gonna be, which is going to be perfectly green. There's always going to be an impact. Do you agree, uh, Hendrika? Yes, I think, of course, right. Um, uh, I think uh, mining became uh, more uh, sensitive, uh, again, um, uh, confronted with environmental issues and is more efficiency oriented. But of course, I mean, there is a lot of things we can do. But as a, I think if we can, uh, I, 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 I doubt at this moment that we can really become uh, that we can really get uh, a clean mining at the very end. I mean, what we can do, we can shut down illegal and unregulated mines, for example, we can clean up the sites of shutdown mines, we can we have evaluate cutoff grades, we can choose environmentally friendly general mining processes, of course, that's a huge topic, and we can do some research in it, intensify the research to do that. We can, um, of course, you know, for example, I, I work um, uh, on the EU budget for 2022 and um, as uh, the green three strategic points, we, we, we are, we decided to focus on climate aspects and environmental aspects and also in research and development, because this is such a key factor for green industrial policy, but also for raw materials, right, and to use to use them in a more efficient and environmental friendly way. So I think there is a lot we can do if we can really be, uh, become or get a uh, uh, clean mining at all. This I seriously, seriously doubt at this moment, but there's a lot of, thing, lot, lot of things we can do at uh, various levels and we should, we should do that. Thank you, Henrique. I have to say that there is a very interesting debate on the chat that is taking place. Um, besides the questions that you are asking, we have uh, a bit of a debate as well. They're writing comments, not only questions. And there is a question that has been uh, written, and maybe Henrique could give us an answer to that question. Is Gérard Van Giet, I think she said, uh, says that China already has a very powerful position that is linked to, to the production of raw materials. And don't you think that we're a bit late with the strategy that you were talking about? Isn't the EU a bit late to the race? I mean, it's it's never it's never too late to learn, right, and to to make things better than than before. And but of course, you you are right that we're late. We should have done that uh, um, a long time ago. And then when we talk, ex example about, for example, about industry, the industry strategy, we will have um, an update um, at the end of April this year uh, from a strategy we received from the Commission last year. Um, we could integrate uh, so many aspects and green transition aspects much more than we did before. And this is also what we do at the Parliament's level in the European Union, but also at the European Commission now that we learned and that we try to make it better in the future. And from my perspective, I think we have to be more radical, but also 
um, you know, radical in searching for practical solutions, of course, but also I think um, we also have to, to debate uh, the European position here. I mean, I think I don't have um, a problem with that if the European Union takes the lead, for example, in, in, in issues of energy efficiency and uh, you know, using renewable energies or uh, using a green, uh, green raw materials or focus more on that, right? Um, so we should really take the lead and uh, learn from China in a way that uh, we, we really develop um, techniques and um, way to produce that is no more related necessarily to China's, um, uh, China's delivery of raw materials, but really to, to get smarter, to, to focus on research and development and to be, to be independent, right? Uh, also on a global scale uh, and to focus on what is important to us uh, to, to rely to environmental standards, to social standards, Standards as well when we produce, uh, you know, that we have a cons kind of consumption that is um, really related to uh, the environment, right? And there's lots of things we can do, and uh, we always have to be smarter than in the past. So I'm, I'm uh, rather positive in that, that we can still work on these issues in a very constructive way. Siempre es bueno ser, ser positivo y, y constructivo. Positive eh, and constructive, yes. And as for whether mining is clean or dirty or that is is really the the hot topic on the chat i'm going to read some of those comments just to see what you think about them there are people who say that the starting point for the mining should be to to respect the same environmental regulations that any other sector would have if we want to talk about clean mining well and you know not you have to consider that it will never be really clean but sort of clean and what happens when when we don't want to have mines in our countries because we think as Guillaume said that they leave scars that the process is not clean at all that refining causes many environmental problems and health problems and so on but if we don't have mines in Europe then we also lose that um, leverage or the power over something so these are the comments that they were writing down and I wanted to know what do you think about them Guillaume and Henrique well uh, I think it's it's very true maybe not to oppose green dirty my uh, clean dirty mining I like the word the phrase responsible mining I think that's a fair phrase because it doesn't say clean, but it's say responsible, which means I respect the regulations and I do my best. And I think uh, we can expect industrials to, to do their best in the framework of the regulations which apply to them. So I like this word responsible mining. And I think as long as we let other countries do this mining for, for us, it's gonna be very hard to control what's happening. Um, Beijing doesn't know what's happening 800 kilometers away from Beijing. How could we Europeans make sure that we're gonna have our standards apply to Chinese uh, miners and Chinese refining industries? That's gonna be very difficult just to have the information. When you know that Beijing cannot even have the information, how could we six, seven, seven, eight thousand kilometers away have the information? That's why I believe and that goes back to the second point that at some point we should have this mining in our countries. And not only because of the mineral sovereignty that we will bring, but also because it will be cleaner. And because it's certainly a good ecological decision to actually relocate the mining in our countries. And that is very provocating to say, uh, you know, uh, if we reopen mines in France and Spain, Spain has a lot of rare earths, by the way, in the Canary Islands around. But if we reopen mines in our countries, we're gonna be clean. And that seems very provocating, but if you, I prefer this cleaning industry, this mining industry with our standards and they're gonna be applied because there's gonna be regulations and supervision of the regulations. I prefer that, I prefer that relocating on my, on my continent rather than just not knowing what's happening wherever these mines are being, uh, extra, these metals are being extracted. But that doesn't mean, I mean, first it's, it's, very, it's gonna be very hard because there are social unrest around mining areas in Europe. It's in France, just forget about it. Nobody in France wants to hear about that. I think we are, and I am in a contradictory position because I don't want to ex accept that if I want to, to drive clean, we'll have to dig deeper. 
And we don't want to accept that. But uh, so it's going to be very hard to be completely, you know, sovereign. It's going to be impossible, by the way, not even talking about the down the stream industry uh, process, but it's going to be very hard. So at some point, we're going to have to, to, to get lithium from Bolivia and Australia and copper from Chile and, and copper from Canada, maybe, or Filipinos, Filipi, Philippine Islands. But uh, obviously, yes, there is some ground um, and a constructive ground to be uh, thought uh, at the EU level for uh, making sure that our regulations oblige EU companies to make sure that their subcontractors respect our own standards, our own regulations. And that is a way for us maybe to actually to enlarge the scope of our laws and our norms towards uh, other uh, mining countries through that, uh, through that EU regulation that could be applied uh, to the subcontractors of our EU companies. Yeah, thank you very much uh, also for, for this question um, and comment. And I think um, I would rather prefer the term responsible mining instead of a clean mining because um, clean mining can be used as well from an Australian company, for example, using fracking technology, right? Um, uh, so, you know, uh, responsible, mi responsible mining uh, would, would uh, somehow more um, determine what we mean by that. We shall undertake spatial assessment assessments um, to assess and address overlapping risk for mining in terms of risk to biodiversity, to groundwater and freshwater reserves. And in doing so, it should also um, demonstrate it has mapped to the extent to which potential overlaps could threaten um, um, habitats and biodiversity, agricultural production, food security, drinking water supplies, all these things that are very important, of course, um, uh, uh, with reference to the local communities living there. And um, these assessments must be publicly uh, available. I think that's very important. And um, of course, we should also increase the international pressure. Uh, for example, right, we uh, currently debate in the European Parliament the Comprehensive Investment Agreement with China, right? And this uh, have to be put on the table that uh, these kind of issues, we must uh, ensure that China adheres the global and international national rules of standards. So uh, lots of things we can do on the parliament level as well on the, at the level of the European Union. But um, yeah, responsible mining that will be um, in, the center, in, the, in the center, of course, of the uh, um, following years when we talk again about green, uh, greening the industry, greening the economy in Europe as well. So it's a part of an overall strategy. Um, we have to be responsible uh, with the environment and everything. Um, we, we act for. Regarding this uh, responsible mining, there are some comments being made and some links being shared on the chat and some, some directives uh, that are EU. Actually, Vicente Gutierrez tells us that there is a European directive that has to do with with the um, Natura 2000 for extractive industries that was published by the EU that gives some examples of what could be good practices uh, for mining. I don't know, Richard, if you have something to say with regards to what we are reading now. Um, well, but actually, uh, I'm not a specialist uh, in these uh, uh, regulations, but they uh, they are hugely important uh, when it comes to uh, um, mining projects and uh, in uh, in Europe and avoiding uh, uh, ecological uh, damage. I was just wondering uh, if Henrique agrees with uh, Guillaume's point that. Uh, mining within Europe would be the most ecological solution? It always depends on the circumstances, of course. I mean, in general, you just can't say that. I mean, if you have the same opportunity to find the raw materials in Europe you're looking for as you do, as you can in other countries like in China, so that would be one consideration, of course. But on the other hand, I mean, of course you're right. Everything what we can do in Europe uh, in this context um, with the background of environmental standards linked to the EU or to national standards, um, uh, this is better than we do than 
done then if it's done without these kind of standards but of course it's not it doesn't have the same potential the raw materials we don't find we need uh, at the moment for the current production we have uh, in europe so this is not no real alternative but all the measures we we were mentioning before focusing on resource efficiency um, on alternatives that we re do some research on that so this is a wide field we can work on of course Thank you. We're talking a bit about whether mining here in Europe would be a more responsible mining. And I would also like to, to benefit from the fact that we're finishing now the debate to ask for solutions. Because you've talked about circular economy, you have talked about reducing consumption, you've talked about recycling, you've talked about substituting, replacing. I don't know if you could dig deeper and tell us what would be the solution that we would be considering in the short or even medium term, because this dilemma seems to be complicated. I mean, the solution isn't easy, that's for sure. If you want to begin, Henrike, since you're already on my screen, and then Guillaume, maybe? Yeah, I mean, this is actually actually what we talk about, right, in this in this webinar tonight, to, to, to find an overall uh, solution. And there were so many um, uh, things we mentioned already, right, to focus on um, uh, efficiency, resource efficiency, to reduce the resources, to change uh, the, the way we produce, um, to use the, the newest uh, techniques, right, like uh, in the context of circular economy as well. And I think in the core of all these measurements should really uh, be the Green Deal, of course, and um, that we really um, consider and, and know that we have to change something, that we have to act now, right? Uh, that we have to uh, achieve at least our climate goals, that we have to achieve uh, our goals um, of the decarbonization of the industry at uh, 2050 at the latest, right? All these kind of things mean that we really have to change change something and we have to do that uh, in the dialogue uh, with the stakeholders, right? Means like um, the industry, the companies, um, the politicians, um, the local community, um, the research experts, because we don't have uh, any other chance than to act in a responsible way now, right? Because we want to, we want to preserve our nature, we want to preserve our planet, and we can change the way uh, we, we, we produce and we can green our economy. And this is something which is a very challenging task at the moment, uh, but it's very, very exciting. And I really love that because there's so much potential for uh, to do good things for the people in Europe, right? Um, just the, the job potential we have here when we, when we focus on green uh, economy and also using um, green raw materials, for example, right? To find new solutions and um, to do something innovative. And I think that's a great, uh, task uh, we can work on all together right because we all do that right right here at the moment um seeing each other and talk to each other and um there's only one one way we can do that um we, we orientate towards the future and um let's do that and i can i can answer uh, following uh, enrique han uh, i've been following this uh, issue of remittals for the last 12 years and in 2010, there was uh, an embargo, a Chinese embargo, informal embargo over Japan and the United States, a nowhere earth at all for six months. And that was a wake up call for everyone in the world and in, the, in Europe uh, to figure out what's going on. And this is at this moment that the first uh, critical raw material list was uh, edited back in 2011. And aside from this uh, list, uh, the first solutions were suggested to how could we, uh, you know, not rely anymore on Chinese supplies and more generally, how should we uh, extract these resources in a better way. The solutions have been known for 10 years. If you go to the raw material units uh, section of the European Commission, uh, the, uh, the raw material unit is very interesting and the page is, is great. I'd like to share it with you if I can, but they say everything we have to do and they've been saying it for 10 years. And uh, what we need to do now is actually not better than anything that has been said for the last 10 years. And what is it? And what do they say? 
let me just put you the link to the to the page, which is always interesting to look at. But basically, uh, it's what uh, Henrike Hanna said: uh, ethical mining. It starts with here. It starts with how do we make sure that we limit the the environmental impact of, of mining and extracting and 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 and, and refining. Uh, circular economy is just absolutely fundamental. A th a circular economy is not only recycling. It is seven pillars that start from the mining process until the recycling, but in the middle you have eco-design, um, collection of uh, secondary resources. How do we collect these resources which are scattered everywhere in Europe or in the world? How do we make interesting volumes, bring interesting volumes together to actually be able to recycle them? But we can, before recycling, we can reuse, we can repair and reuse. Uh, so these are a set of solutions in order to make uh, our world not only a low resource world, as I said, but a, a low carbon world, but a low resource world. And that, that obviously is very, very important to be able to apply each of these seven pillars of circular economy, because that will help us not having to go back to the mine. And it's not gonna be a miracle solution. We still have to go back to the mine, but we can obviously limit the impact of mining if we are able to, to apply a successful circular economy strategy. Recycling and substitution is important. How do we substitute one metal which is very polluting by another metal? Japan is very strong in this regard. Japan has no resource. They are very much dependent on China. You know the relationship between Japan and China. They don't like each other. Japan doesn't want to be reliant on heavy rare earths or neodymium, which is a rare earth from, from, from China. So they are trying to develop magnets, which are made not of neodymium, but of cerium, which is another rare earth. It makes less powerful magnets, but still it's interesting uh, magnets to be industrialized and marketed. And it has a less important impact on the environment because cerium is a much more uh, abundant uh, I mean, less rare, should I say, more abundant in the earth than, than neodymium. So substitution is something we should really work on. And this is where also the European Commission has a, a role to play in order to help funding projects, which is already the case under, under HV uh, 2020, by the way, but funding more projects in order to develop these substitutions. The private sector is very important here because, you know, in my country in France, we have lots of small startups uh, which are trying to develop and to bring to the market Markets, interesting new materials, uh, new substitutes, uh, but actually there is no financing sector interested in financing them. So you talk about big data, we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about connected objects, we are all dreaming about all these wonderful words, but when it comes to funding the projects which help making the materials, which are without which there would be no AI and no connected objects and no deep learning, no one's there because there is no raw material culture. So how do we make sure that the private sector is actually following here? Seeing the interest of funding in long-term these companies, EU funded companies with EU public funds at the beginning in order to help them becoming uh, uh, larger scale companies and make sure that the solution which is already existing makes its way to the market. And this is a huge question. Otherwise we're gonna have EU funded small companies finding substitutes which are going to be bought back by UK or US, uh, US uh, private funds. And we're gonna have our technologies which are just going to go away. And what are we gonna do with our mineral sovereignty? So I think really we should really, the EU financing sector is really important here. And then I just want to mention mineral diplomacy. We've talked about that and education because uh, mining jobs is not very exciting when you're 20 years old, but actually it should be exciting because I mean, if I had to choose between working in the oil sector or in the mineral sector, I would work in the mineral sector. And when I speak with students from universities or schools, wherever in Europe, I say to them, just have a look at the kind of discussions we're having right now today. Just get into the stakes around this discussion. Realize that this is new world awakening. And you're gonna, you're gonna want to be part of that. So you're gonna want to be part of that in your laboratory or in your startup because you're gonna be part of this larger picture which you need to understand. And also here, you need to develop education and understanding and culture, which is something the Roma Unit tries to do and the European Commission tries to do. But obviously there is a ground here and, and space for uh, making our young uh, students more aware of these stakes and willing to actually participate in this world. 
Creo que como comentas, la, la innovación va a ser... Va a ser... That, as you said, innovation is going to be fundamental. And on the chat, they were saying that for wind turbines, for instance, and for wind turbines, they were experimenting with other components that, that with, other, uh, with other magnets that that and um, with other elements that don't require so many magnets. So I think that innovation is going to be very interesting. Guillaume, I wanted to ask you because I read some of the things that you have said in interviews, and I also wanted to bring um, a topic that has to do with CO2 emissions. You said, because obviously here, I mean, we're talking about something that has to do with how we consume our consumption model. I guess that not everyone can change his old car for an uh, e-car, and I don't know if that really makes sense even, but you were saying that obviously we also have to think about the manufacturing process because e-cars also produce CO2. So I don't know if you want to say something uh, about that, yeah. because I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, offshore turbines use uh, permanent magnets made of neodymium, but you can also make uh, uh, turbines without neodymium and with uh, copper, uh, copper turbines, uh, so uh, copper rotors made of copper. So yes, obviously there are solutions. Uh, for the electric cars, uh, we, we should... Uh, the thing is, it's not just green or not green. Uh, a, a, a car is as dirty, an electric car is as dirty as, uh, as the electricity uh, which uh, is put into its battery. Uh, if the electricity comes from a uh, nuclear industry, which doesn't produce CO2 or very few, well, at the end of the year of the life cycle, and if you make a life cycle analysis of an electric car, it's going to be very great for CO2 emissions. So you're going to have very few CO2 emissions for e-car comparing to an oil car, and that is usually the case. Usually the case in 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 Europe and especially in France because we have a huge nuclear uh, electricity. Uh, our electricity is produced by nuclear electricity uh, industries, power plants. But if you go to China, where 75% of the electricity is produced by uh, oil and coal. Well, it's very bad. And it's not because the car doesn't produce uh, CO2 when you drive that you don't need to produce electricity somewhere and notably through a coal power plant, which has at some point, uh, you know, a, a, a rejected CO2 in the air. So the, the, there is no direct link, special link between when you use it and when you emit the CO2 but this link has to be made somehow for the reasons that I've explained. So actually the CO2 is somewhere, especially if you're in China. So that's what I wanna explain. Uh, if you are in Europe, wonderful for having an e-car. And I, I say it all the time, you, you know, it's always better for uh, CO2 emissions to have an electric car. If you're in China, uh, actually there were some researches being made at the European level. Actually I have the research in front of me. I think that is by the European, uh, environmental body. Um, electric cars in China can re reject in their whole life three to four times more CO2 than an oil car. So we need to understand that. And we tend to think that, you know, because the life cycle analysis in terms of CO2 emissions is good in Europe, well, we're fine. But we need to consider, Carol, that there is not a European climate change and a Chinese climate change. There is a global climate change. And what is being rejected in China will at some point end up in Europe. And that is very good to just look at the life cycle analysis of e-cars in Europe. But if you just disconsider, disregard what's happening in China with the figures I've just told you, then there is a problem. So I think we should really have a global view. Let me be clear. I always prefer electric cars to oil cars. And I say it, uh, we should go towards this transition, but uh, we should be careful of all these nuances of green or non-green technologies, uh, which must be taken into consideration, especially when we look at the uh, Chinese uh, electric mix. Thank you. Um... I'm afraid it's 13.24. We have one last question. 
that, I would like to ask Henrike, and then we will very quickly let you uh, share some last comments if you wish to do so. So Henrike, they were saying here in the chat that it would, they're asking if it would be correct to avoid trade with the countries that are not respecting environmental laws, or if we should avoid trade altogether or to pressure with, um, with sanctions so that it is too expensive for them and they choose to react and correct the situation. I don't know, what do you think about this? I think from the European perspective, of course, it wouldn't be useful uh, at all to avoid trade, right, uh, in general. This is, uh, doesn't make any sense. But of course, when we nego negotiate trade agreements, of course, we have a powerful instrument in our hands. When we, when we go to the table to discuss the conditions that we say, hey, we want to have, um, uh, we want to have environmental standards and social standards implemented in and at the very beginning of the bargaining process, but we can use Use that as a tool right and if this is not uh, implemented we can reject this agreement even if all of our sides are interested in participating so it's a powerful instrument we should use a lot more and i think the greens are always outstanding in uh, really um claiming for for that um precious instrument that we really use it um, and I think um, also, you know, in this, in this context, we, sh we should, for example, the China uh, investment uh, agreement, right? Uh, this is something is, which is a powerful instrument we could, we could use here. Uh, so I can't, um, I don't follow the, the argument that we should avoid trade and not at all. It's, I think it's part of the European Union that um, it, 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 one of its core values, right? That we, that we appreciate, um, um, you know, the trade aspect and that we, we, we can uh, live in a better way together if, if we share and if we uh, look at each other's standards and if we discuss and, and find solutions in that regard. Okay, gracias, Nada. 30 segundos para Richard, Guillaume, and Enrique, and we cerramos. Richard, Guillaume, and Henrique, and then we will finish this, so, this, this interesting debate. So, Richard? Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the final remark um, is uh, that as Greens, we should um, um, uh, also dare um, uh, to question our uh, consumption patterns, patterns when they're resource um, intensive. Um, I mentioned the question, should we uh, replace every fossil fuel car with an uh, electric car or should we um, uh, try to share um, uh, our e-cars and uh, that opens up uh, a field of action for um, other governments than the EU uh, as well, especially for local governments, because of course, local policies have a huge impact on uh, the number of private cars we will have in the uh, future. It's local governments who can uh, develop and promote um, and finance uh, better alternatives. So um, that's the last point I'd like to make. Okay, thank you, Guillaume, 30 seconds. Uh, 30 seconds just to say that uh, uh, also uh, the question of the carbon tax, I think, is an excellent issue that has been raised by the uh, European Commission. And that can help actually uh, rebalancing the, the, the cost of our uh, the environmental cost, our technologies, uh, if we are able to uh, to uh, to uh, apply such a carbon tax for materials which are entering the European market that maybe brings a balance with uh, that, that enables sorry, our industry to be more competitive comparing to Chinese uh, industries and maybe to have EU uh, made uh, industries uh, that we can consume in our territories. And that is always better for the environment. So I really strongly believe in such a carbon tax. Thank you. Enrique, finally. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, I can agree with you, Guillaume, uh, that a carbon um, uh, adjustment mechanism is, is very important and also a, an important tool. We can use that. I mean, just to have a look at the 5455 legislative package we, we uh, expect this year. This will be a very important 
um, a package uh, for the climate, but also for, again, for the raw materials, the green industry policy we have here and has different impacts. And, but we definitely want that we have uh, an economy that is resilient, competitive and sustainable in Europe, but also we have to integrate um, uh, all what we talked about today on raw materials, uh, these aspects that we have to reduce the, uh, the, the, the impact on the environment, on the environment and climate and that we need a sustainable economy. We have a lot of chances and possibilities to do that. And um, I think we definitely have to. So let's, let's look what happens this year. Pues muchísimas gracias a nuestras expertas por las interesantes reflexiones. To our experts for such interesting thoughts and comments. Thank you to all of you who followed along this debate and thank you to the La Casa Encendida and the Green European Foundation and Transición Verde for making all this possible. I wanted to say that on April 7th, we will have the second round table of this uh, cycle that will tackle the limits and the impact of rare metals. And for that session, we will have Alicia Valera, who is uh, the leader of the Industrial Ecology Research Group in Zaragoza, Juan Cholo Pezuralde, who is the president of the Ecological Commission here at the Congress in Spain, and Mr. Barajas, who is a member of Ecologistas in, in Acción and an expert in mining. So you're invited. It will be a very interesting debate. So thank you all very much for being here today and I hope you will have a lovely day.